Hey, welcome to Fish. First I see Kim, and my name is Linda. So, all right, let's just say today for argument's sake that if Jesus is God, why doesn't he, well, you know, just simply show himself, appear, right? Just come down and show himself to everybody so that everyone could see him, right? I mean, they see him, there's no mistaking him, it's Jesus, you know. And then once that's established, he can, oh, you know, do some really cool miracles, right? Like raise some people from the dead, get some patients healed of cancer, you know, get some kids out of wheelchairs, all that stuff, right? I mean, that would absolutely convince everyone that Jesus is here, right? I mean, he could do this. It makes a lot of sense, don't you think? I mean, wouldn't it just all solve everything, like everything political, everything religious, and everything ethnic? Solve all the BS in regards to those things, right? And wouldn't it just like bring peace on earth if Jesus was down here and everyone realized it's him? Wouldn't it just unify us under his kingship? Nope. Nope. The Bible says no. And Jesus says no. So let's go into Luke 16, 17 to 31. Open your Bibles to Luke 16, 27 to 31. And just to give you a little background on this scripture is, is Lazarus He's the poor guy. He's on the sidewalk. He eats the food with the dogs, right? I mean, he's he's in pretty bad shape, but he believes. He he believes. And then the rich guy who lives in this mansion has everything that you could ever want on earth, but he doesn't believe, right? He denies. So they both die almost around the same time. And now Jesus is telling what is going on with Lazarus the poor beggar, and the rich man, whose name we never know. And here it starts, Luke 16, 27, 31. Then he said, this is the rich guy, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Now what he's saying is send Lazarus, okay, which is interesting. He hasn't changed. The rich man hasn't changed. He's going to order Lazarus to his brothers. Okay? So, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So, even though the rich guy is in this really bad place, he's still giving orders. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, this is the rich guy, No, no father, Abraham. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. So he still wants to order Lazarus, and he's arguing. Interesting. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hmm. Still not convinced? Okay, that's fine. Let's go into Revelation. Revelation 1 7. Every eye will see him, meaning Jesus, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth. And Revelation 6 16. They call to the mountains. This is now when Jesus appears, right? He's, he's down. Everyone sees him. They call to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. This seems pretty obvious to me what the Bible's saying. It's known to everyone on earth that it's Jesus and he's here. They see him. Everybody sees him, right? And his risen power and glory. And they do what? Are they asking for forgiveness? 
Nope again. Are they repenting? Mm -mm. Are they falling on their knees begging for mercy? No, 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 no. Will they acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior? Okay, no, enough already. They run. They hide. They ask for rocks to fall on them. Rocks inside the mountains. So they're in the mountains and they want to be buried or crushed alive rather than turn to Jesus. That's pretty crazy and interesting. And more interesting in Revelation is the opening of the seventh seal. Hang in there with this. It begins when the seal is opened and there is silence for about a half hour. That is not good. The calm before the storm. And then literally all hell breaks out. A third of the earth is charred. A third of living creatures of the sea die. A third of the ships on the ocean are destroyed. A third of the waters become bitter. A third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars are struck and become darkened. A third of mankind perishes due to the opening of the abyss. Now, the abyss is not a good place. We hear about it right now. The abyss is frightening. The Bible states under the fifth trumpet, and the fifth angel sounded the trumpet, and I saw a star fall out of heaven into the ground and the key to the abyss, to the unfathomable abyss was given to him. And he opened the unfathomable abyss and smoke arose from the underworld like the smoke from a great furnace and the smoke darkened the sun and the air. The demons which crawl out of the abyss to sting and torment them, those left behind, for five months, and they still refuse to repent and acknowledge Jesus as Lord and God. Amazing. And we just go a little bit further into Revelation 20, 1 through 6. Revelation 20, 1 through 6. This describes a period of 1,000 years wherein Satan, right, is in, he's bound, but it's not forever. And the people of God, right, who were taken up before with God, before the tribulation reign during this 1,000 years. So in other words, all is calm. Because Jesus is large and in charge. Well, Satan is loosed again for a little season. And survivors of the tribulation will side with Satan and rebel against Christ in the final war of all time known as Gog and Magog. So you're thinking, well, why not just do away with Satan once and for all? Why is he bound up temporarily? Okay, for the sake of hair splitting, I'm not going to really go there. But the point is, in a nutshell, is that, well, we're going to get to it. You'll see. Maybe I should just explain this at the end. I'll explain it at the end. So now is the final war of Gog and Magog. And the day will come when Jesus appears in the clouds, resurrected, in power, and great glory for everyone to see, all right? So we have Satan loosed, the tribulation survivors with him. They're rejecting Christ. They're going to go to battle. Jesus comes down, boom, he's like amazing. However, even then, all right, seeing him in all his glory and power, obvious and undeniable, most people on earth will reject him and seek another God. This is amazing. All right? This is amazing. So going back, 
This is when God will allow Satan to provide them just what they they want, what their wicked hearts desire, the risen Antichrist. So this is just going back a little bit. I know this is a little confusing, but at the end I will I will um, explain it all in a row. So the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the greatest military genius in history who never lost a battle. He rose from the dead and claims he can defeat Jesus to prevent his return and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. And what do you think the reaction will be of the believers, of the unbelievers? They're like, great, bring it on. They will welcome the Antichrist and give him and Satan the worship they stubbornly deny Jesus. Sure, Jesus is God. And yes, Jesus can do whatever he wants, of course. He's sovereign. He can appear at will. All right, so now here's the explanation. But the Bible unequivocally states, even if he did, those who chose to reject him still will. Remember, God gave us free will, which means Jesus. Jesus will not force himself on us. He will not force himself on anyone. So receiving Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Savior and God must be voluntary. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Look, Jesus did all that was necessary to save us. Nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to deserve or earn salvation. Absolutely nothing. All we do is receive the precious gift of Jesus into our hearts. Or not. It's our choice. Ours alone. Free will. And guess what? Us humans will continue to exercise our power of free will. The God-given free will. And despite God, or absolute proof of God, well, we will exercise this to the very end. It's interesting. The Bible is so interesting because, you know, it's not an uncommon thought to think like, well, if Jesus just appeared now and everyone could see that it's him, they would, they would come to him and understand and there would be peace on earth. No, no, you always have those that are going to reject him no matter what. That's what it says in the Bible. Remember, Scripture is always true. It's, it's by God. God never loses. Like I said, go in the Bible. You will never see a time in the Bible that God loses. All right? And since He is absolute truth, and the Bible is the living Word of God, Scripture is true. So people, until the end of the world will reject Christ despite how he shows himself, despite his glory, despite his power, despite his mercy, despite his forgiveness and love. They will reject him. They will go underground and rather be crushed. They will side with Satan rather than go to God and be saved. It's very unfortunate. It's probably one of the most important decisions we can make in our lifetime. It is. And it's so easy to do, but it's for some reason so difficult for us to, to do it. Um, you do. You just you pray. You give your life to Jesus. You just say, come in, to, come in Lord. I you know, acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. I confess my sins unto you. you know. And if you're a new believer or sitting on the fence, go into John. Read all of John, the Gospel of John. It's beautiful. That's that's personally speaking here. That's the first one I went into it was John. And ever since then, you know, you you go through the Bible, you go through Bible studies, you, you talk with other believers. And yes, I know I 
um, hit on church a lot. What I'm trying to do is shake you up a bit, especially those that do believe, is shake you up a bit so that the pieces fall in their priority. And the priority is God. All right. First, you seek him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It's not about church. Yes, if you learn stuff from there and you get fellowship there, I have no problem with that. That's not up to me. What I'm saying is, is that many of us buy into religion and we miss the experience of God. We miss the relationship with Jesus. What I'm trying to do is shake you up. You see him, you experience him, you focus on him. And once you're solid with that, you'll understand the rest, okay? The Holy Spirit will guide you. That's what he's there for. That's our connection with God. And that's why we are told to pray all the time because it's a direct communication and it's personal and no one else can interfere with that. All right. So listen, that's it for fish. First, I seek him. My name is Linda. And until next time.